Bioshock is my favorite game of all time, no exaggeration, and it's been that way for many years. Even after countless playthroughs, there's just something about this game. The world building, environments, that indescribable atmosphere that makes the world of Rapture feel so real. It's an absolute masterpiece and a classic first person shooter. If you've never played it before, I'm telling you, you won't be disappointed. And the other games are great too. I mean, I just love Bioshock as a franchise, and I've wondered for quite a while now what might have been cut from the game, because I remember seeing some old beta gameplay footage that looked almost unrecognizable compared to the final release. So what else could be different? I thought we'd explore that here today, kind of like the same thing we did for the Manhunt series, but this time with the three Bioshock games. So today, we're going to be taking a look at the lost and cut content of Bioshock. I think it's best to start with the original pitch for Bioshock, which the developer Irrational Games was using to find a publisher for their new title, which would eventually be 2K Games. And this original pitch, while having a lot of core elements that would remain in the final game, has quite a few key differences. For one, their original logo is very reminiscent of System Shock 2, which this game takes quite a lot of inspiration from, as it was also developed by Irrational Games. And in the pitch overview, it is described as such, quote, Bioshock is a modern-day nightmare of the terrifying nexus between religious fanaticism and unbounded science. The player must come to grips with the remnants of a dangerous cult and the technological and biological horrors they've created in their underground and undersea complex that lies beneath the sands of a seemingly deserted island. And it was also planned in this pitch that there would be a multiplayer mode, which wouldn't be fulfilled until Bioshock 2. Although it was stated in this pitch that players would face off in a quote, story-based deathmatch. Now, with the story, it gets really interesting. As originally, it would take place in the modern era at the time, in the year 2007, with you taking the role of Carlos Coelho, who is tasked with infiltrating a religious cult on a remote island in order to rescue a wealthy heiress. It was also said that Bioshock would offer a deep layer of customization in terms of weapons and environmental manipulation, and from what it looks like, the modification system planned was a bit more in-depth than the one we got in the game. One of the things that was kept though was the ability to hack security, such as cameras, turrets, and alarms. But the environmental aspect was planned to be a lot deeper, with the player being able to manipulate gravitational fields, oxygen, magnetization, ionization, and temperature, which would all affect gameplay in pretty substantial ways. The game also had genetic modifications, like in the final release, and it also played a large role in the original story. Which also interestingly, despite having a very different direction of story, also started with a plane crash. There were also these early splicers, which weren't called that in this pitch, but were basically the same concept. Horrifying humans disfigured by DNA tampering, and these early monsters were very disturbing way more so than the actual splicers of Bioshock. And there's really a lot to this pitch, but we'd be here all day, this is just the pitch. In terms of content directly cut from Bioshock, well there's quite a bit. First, there were quite a few gameplay features which ended up being cut, such as the atmospheric pressure system, which was planned to be a very in-depth gameplay mechanic, in which the player could control the air pressure in a given area, having it be low, normal, or high which would all affect gameplay in some way, like affecting the lighting in a given area, or even changing how the AI moved or how the sandbox and environment would react. For example, flames such as with the incinerate plasmid or chemical thrower would shoot farther under low pressure, while under high pressure things would be more likely to explode upon impact. There were even a multitude of gene tonics that were planned to be a part of this mechanic most of which could only be utilized under certain pressure settings. However, it was eventually scrapped as it was too difficult to actually get across the many subtle changes from each pressure setting. Also, the concept of dual wielding was very much planned for this game, being able to use both a weapon in your right hand as well as a plasmid in your left, just like you can in Bioshock 2. But for some reason, this feature was cut on pretty short notice. 
I'm guessing it might have had something to do with the weapons that Jack uses in the game, as I don't really see how you could operate the shotgun, crossbow, or chemical thrower for example with one hand, let alone reload them. It's one thing for a big daddy to do it, and they really built the weapons around that whole mechanic from the beginning. But then again, it's also possible that it could have worked like it does in Bioshock 2's multiplayer, where you hold the guns normally for the most part with two hands, but you still have access to your plasmids in your left hand that you could use at any time. But another interesting difference that was planned was for research, which would still have you taking pictures of splicers and such for rewards. But instead of just needing film and getting a rating, you would have to take those photos and bring them to a research machine to develop the pictures, which would actually cost money in order to get your progress and rewards. Now, I honestly think this idea is kind of cool. Yeah, it's an extra step, and maybe it wouldn't be worth the hassle for some people, but after so many playthroughs of this game, I find it's just really easy to get max research on just about every subject in Rapture, as long as you take a picture of like every enemy you see. But I don't know, let me know what you guys think. The game was also planned to have one ending, instead of multiple depending on your choices with the little sisters throughout the game. And it's interesting because this one ending was planned even when the little sister choices still existed in the game. It wasn't until the publisher requested multiple endings that Irrational Games added them. We don't know what this original ending was, all we know are some pretty vague quotes from Ken Levine, who described the ending as about, quote, a life that is sort of absent from a moral structure, and quote, the moral ambiguity of the world, whatever that means. Also in some of the trailers and gameplay showcases, there are many cut aspects that never made it to the final game or were heavily changed. First off, in the Hunting the Big Daddy trailer, we can see quite a few things including a new teleportation plasmid which never made it to the game. But I'll save all the plasmid stuff for later. Gameplay wise, you can see the player leaning as they peek down a hallway, which of course was cut. But this gameplay demo wasn't actually the first. The first Bioshock tech demo showed a lot more, as it actually showed an early HUD which was vastly different. Also, funnily enough, the big daddy in this demo is really tiny. Also, we can see when they loot the cash register that Adam was first the base currency of the game, and there actually was no money. You can also see in this same demo that you can activate security by using Adam, or by the classic hacking approach. It would also cost Adam though it looks like to use a plasmid equip station, which had many different slots including weapons, engineering, physical, and active, which kind of operate like the gene tonics do in the real game. But now let's get to what everyone is probably most interested in, the plasmids. There's the teleportation plasmid shown off in the Hunting the Big Daddy trailer, however it was hard to implement into the game as it caused various bugs and glitches, so it was eventually cut pretty late into development. Although there is a really cool kind of nod or easter egg to this plasmid in Bioshock 2, which has an unstable teleportation plasmid which will teleport the player erratically around Fontaine Futuristics. Next, there is the Aggressor Irritant Plasmid, shown off in the first tech demo, which basically would act as an inverse to the Enrage Plasmid, so if you used it on a splicer or any enemy, then the nearby enemies would attack them. Parasitic Healing was another cut plasmid, in which you would fire some sort of energy bolt which would cause damage to the enemy and then heal you. And interestingly, this was also going to be used by some of the spider splicers in the game at some point. Speaking of that, in other early versions of the game, hacking didn't pause your game, and so you were left vulnerable. And the ultimate solution to this was a plasmid called Sanctuary, which would create a bubble around the player that could absorb damage. However, when they decided the game would pause during hacking, this plasmid really no longer served any purpose in their eyes. There was also one called Speed Booster, which was essentially an early version of what would become Aero Dash from Bioshock 2's multiplayer. And there was also planned to be an upgrade to Telekinesis called Telekinesis 2, which only made it into Bioshock 2 as well. For Gene Tonics, there was one called Organic Pockets, and this one, wow, this would have been so broken. It would basically allow you to carry twice as many first aid kits and EVE hypos. Yeah. 
The game lets you carry nine of each as it is, which is honestly already probably too much. There was also a cut tonic called Shutdown Expert, which would increase the time that security would stay hacked. Although, as you probably know if you've played the game, security remains hacked forever, so this tonic was eventually dropped with that gameplay change. For cut weapons, there was a very interesting one called the Bioweapon, which was basically an early version of the Chemical Thrower, which had four different firing modes. Those being Insect Swarm and Berserk Toxin, which were made into actual plasmids, and Disease Cloud and Generic Repellent. And you can actually find part of this weapon in the game in the Silverwing Apiary. Now, this is definitely the most interesting section in my opinion, as it went through the most changes out of anything here. The enemies and NPCs. And a lot of this includes models and concept art that can be found in the remastered version of Bioshock in the Museum of Orphaned Concepts, which is basically, well, what it sounds like. First of all, there were many, and I mean many, different splicer designs, and a lot of them are very disturbing. Much more so than the more human-like splicers we got in the game. I mean, just look at some of these. Yeah. Some of the splicers were planned to be so spliced that they were almost unrecognizable as human anymore. Which does lend, I think, to the themes of transhumanism and genetic modification present in the game, as well as the horror aspect. And it's really more reminiscent of System Shock 2 than anything else, but I don't know, maybe this was just too much. And while a lot of this art kind of trends toward the more grotesque and mutated direction, at some point in design, they started to focus more on the human side of things, in the end creating a sort of blend between the two styles, as they wanted the splicers to be monsters, but at the same time, the player needed to know that these were once just people, human beings just like them. As seen in the museum, some of the earliest splicers, which were first known as aggressors, can be seen. And interestingly, they are actually rather goofy looking compared to the actual splicers, or even the concept art. Although a lot of these splicers were reworked into the game just in different ways. Such as this one called the Hooker, which would eventually become the Spider Splicer. Or the Missing Link, as this one was called, which would become a working template for the Leadhead Splicers. Or even the Grenadier, who would become the Nitro Splicer. Also, there were early versions of the Gatherers, which were much different from the Little Sisters, and were also more grotesque, as seen in these pieces of concept art. However, in order to get more empathy from the player, especially when it comes to making decisions about harvesting them or not, the Gatherers were changed to Little Sisters. And there were also quite a few big daddy types that were cut, such as the Slow Pro, which was basically an early version of the Rumbler featured in Bioshock 2 as he would move slowly and fire a rocket-type projectile from a large shoulder-mounted cannon. There was also another Big Daddy planned called the Slug Bug, as it was basically a Big Daddy that had a slug taking over its body, and the plan for this Big Daddy was that the only way the player could actually kill it would be to kill the slug that's first attached to it, although this was cut as it seemed to be an unworkable concept. There was another interesting enemy planned for the game called the Savant, and these were genetically modified mini-boss enemies that were quote, heads in jars that would have to be defeated in each level. Although the developers did eventually realize that fighting heads in jars was pretty goofy and made no sense, nor would it have been a fun gameplay experience. But there was another cut enemy, and this one was called the Atom Anomaly. Essentially, it was just a bunch of random objects that were attached with electricity flowing around it. Although, this was cut very early in development. And lastly, for Bioshock 1, there were a couple cut audio diaries. I won't play all of them, because we've been talking about this game for a while now already, but I'll play two of the most interesting ones here. They're all dying. For months, they are fine, and then poof. And from what? Influenza. <laughs> the goddamned flu. The little things are virtually indestructible. A bullet, they heal. Fire, they heal. But if they catch the bug, boom, they are gone in days. Something about the implantation process. Only one of them remains. And she must be resistant to this particular strain. This one little girl, one set of genes. 
Even if all the others die, it will be enough to save the program from extinction. This started out as simple. Take Fontaine's many sub back topside twice a week. Pick up some choice goods not available in a remote place like Rapture, you know. Beef, real tobacco, just a little extras. But now, Ryan and his type have up and called smuggling a hanging crime. Hanging? Says any connection to the surface could destroy the city. For long, only difference between this place and topside is whether or not you can open up the damn windows. Alright, moving on to Bioshock 2. Not as good as the first, but still a great game. Anyways, so let's start with the characters, because there were a lot of notable changes here. In the cut prologue of the game, it was planned that Subject Delta would help Eleanor through the 1958 New Year's Eve riots in a flashback sequence, while being guided by Sophia Lamb over the radio, before eventually getting to her where she would take Eleanor and shoot Subject Delta leaving him for dead, similar to the opening cutscene. Also, Subject Delta, instead of using plasmids through his hands, was going to have parasites come out of those little holes in his gloves and fire the plasmids. Yeah, kinda weird. Also, Tenenbaum was planned to have a much bigger role in the game, including more radio messages, as well as the fact that she would be giving gifts to Subject Delta if he saved the little sisters, similar to what Eleanor does in the final game, or would reprimand him if he didn't. You do this thing to a child. Perhaps I was wrong, and the rapture has cut all the man out of you. There were also some kind of minor differences with some of the other characters, like Stanley Poole, Grace Holloway, and Gil Alexander. It was also planned that in Dionysus Park, instead of dealing with the little sisters for Stanley, you would have to record, quote, illicit activities of one of the characters who never really made an appearance in the game, Ava Tate. At some point, you were also able to save Mark Meltzer's daughter, Cindy Meltzer, which would have given you an achievement. But most of that stuff was not that crazy. Don't worry though, I saved the best for last. Apparently, at some point, it was planned for the iconic Sander Cohen to return, but not as he was in Bioshock 1 but instead as a 20-foot tall monster bunny. Yes, you heard that right. Other than that, there were some slight changes with the multiplayer characters, nothing too crazy here. And there were also quite a lot of other side characters that were cut mostly because their audio diaries were removed. Speaking of which, this game has so many removed radio messages and audio diaries. Like, just look at this, this is honestly kind of crazy. Now, to be fair, some of them are just not in the game, and instead can be found on the Cult of Rapture website. Still, that leaves quite a few that can only be found in the files, and many that don't even have audio and are simply just transcripts. Some are also just alternate versions of already existing audio logs, but here are just some of the cut ones that were found in the audio files. I don't know why Sophia stopped coming here, left me alive like this, and I know that I don't have long before I become psychotic from Adam exposure, but sadly, I am unable to harm myself meaningfully inside the tank. The robotic devices which allow me to speak and observe the facility are my only tools. That, my friend, is why I need you to help me die. Warden, you gotta get me in a different cell. Those goddamn lights and, and shapes out the window. I can't sleep. I can feel my head shaking apart inside. I mean, what is going on here? <laughs> Something's not right out there, Warden. It's like they're whispering to me. I even take solitary over this. Now there's an idea. As for the levels in the game, we already discussed the cut intro sequence, which was also meant to have a protector laboratory as seen in the screenshots. There was also a cut backstory regarding Subject Delta, depicting how he was a deep sea diver who accidentally found Rapture and became trapped there. 
Ryan Amusements only had some minor differences, such as there being a showcase of the origin of Adam in the Hall of the Future, as well as having a different Big Daddy diorama in the Memorial Museum. Interestingly, Popper's Drop and Siren Alley were originally meant to be one level, with it all being one big slum that was connected to the major locations needed for the gameplay and story, those being the diner, church, and the brothel, although it was eventually determined that it was just too much for one level. Originally, Dionysus Park was also very different, and instead was untouched by the chaos of Rapture, and wasn't flooded until much later on in development. And it was in fact owned by that minor cut character we talked about earlier, Ava Tate, who was meant to be a famous movie producer in Rapture. It was also planned at some point that the entrance to Dionysus Park would be through the flooded atrium of Fort Frolic from Bioshock 1. Fontaine Futuristics was also very different originally, and was meant to be mostly underwater and out in the ocean itself. At some point also, there was going to be a scene in Fontaine Futuristics, which would show how Adam was extracted from the Little Sisters, which was eventually cut due to it being pretty brutal according to the developers. As for Persephone, this level was at one point referred to as Eden, and was also meant to be untouched from the Civil War and damage that Rapture took over the years. For the multiplayer maps, Fleet Hall was at one point meant to make an appearance, which would have also had interactable objects that could be used to open the map up and even kill players. There was also planned to be a map set on a film studio soundstage, as well as one referred to in the concept art as Athena Steamworks, which looked like some sort of industrial complex in Rapture. In terms of more gameplay focused stuff, there were some gene tonics that were cut, such as these. There at some point was also an interesting mechanic involving trading with Rapture survivors, which would be done through the Numo machines, where you could buy and sell items, and there's even unused UI of it, as well as concept art of the trading Numo station. However, it was cut due to the Rapture survivors also being cut from the story. We'll get to them a little later. It was also shown in the Hunting the Big Sister trailer that you could scare away some splicers by simply revving up the drill, which is kind of cool, but I can see why they took it out. Now, there was also a drug planned to be in the story called Eden, which was created using Adam and would trigger hallucinations. And Delta was actually planned to take the drug in early versions of Dionysus Park. And in these dreams and hallucinations, Delta would experience his past, as well as see other strange things, including the Cohen Bunny monster we talked about earlier. Along with that element of memories and hallucinations, there were also meant to be ghosts in Bioshock 2, such as the one seen in the launch trailer, which the creative director of the game described more so as playable flashbacks. There was also planned to be underwater combat in the game, which makes sense as portions of the game, like Fontaine Futuristics, were planned to be almost exclusively in water. There's also a research menu which exists in the files that went unused in the actual game, which would show the enemy types, progress, and rewards for the research. And lastly, in the multiplayer there were those interactable elements, some of which are known for a couple of maps. One on Neptune's bounty would allow the player to block a turret using a net full of fish, and another one on Arcadia would release gas automatically if a player walked up to a certain tree. And in Kashmir Restaurant, the player could destroy a cake in the middle of the dining hall, or blow up hidden sticks of TNT located in the bathroom stalls. Moving on to the enemies and NPCs of Bioshock 2, first there were several variations of the basic splicers, there was also concept art of a ducky brute splicer, pretty interesting. Kind of funny though, not gonna lie. There were also different versions of the crawler splicer, one of which had a second mouth on the back of his head. But now we're getting to the more juicy stuff. That sounds kind of strange when we're talking about mutated drug addicts, but whatever. So anyway, there was another type of splicer planned for the game that never made it in, called the Aqua Splicer. And let me tell you, this thing is disgusting and creepy as hell. 
and this would have been one of the enemies found in the underwater segments of the game, as he would have been able to swim, and would appear in a different kind of state compared to when you would find him just walking around Rapture. Next we have the Jesters. As seen in the concept art, these were very tall and slender beings seen wearing Jester outfits, but it's unclear what their purpose would have been. Like, were these supposed to appear in flashbacks, or were these meant to be splicer enemies? We don't really know. Then there are the survivors mentioned earlier, who were going to be some of the last surviving people in Rapture not to have spliced, and were therefore still fully human. They were planned to be not only a part of the trading mechanic, but also play a large role in the story. What that is remains unclear, as they ended up of course being cut. There were also various Big Daddy concepts that never made it into the game, such as this Mutated Alpha series, or this Demo Daddy, also known as the Egg Daddy. Also, it was planned at one point that there would only be one big sister in the game that you would fight throughout it, although that was eventually changed pretty early on. And finally, they also explored the concept of Little Brothers, the male counterpart to the Little Sisters, which is something brought up in Bioshock 1 actually, in one of Tenenbaum's audio logs called Why Just Girls. And it was explained in the Deco Devolution art book, quote, They were supposed to be like Little Sisters, but they were a failed experiment. Little Brothers were supposed to be aggressive, so they couldn't be used for gathering. Although there is concept art that shows what these little brothers might have looked like. And finally we are here, Bioshock Infinite. A great game like all the others, but if I'm being honest, probably my least favorite in the series. In regards to cut content, there's actually quite a lot considering how different this game is from the other two, and a lot of it really saddens me, more so than the other games as a lot of the early stuff that was shown for this game honestly did look better than what we actually got, for the most part at least. I guess the best place to start would be from the beginning, as at first, Bioshock Infinite was going to have Rapture as its setting, and instead would explore the collapse of Rapture as it happened, taking place before and during the Civil War. Although this idea was eventually thrown out, as they liked the ambiguity surrounding the conflict. Instead, they chose to pursue a new setting, toying around with the idea of something in the Renaissance period before eventually creating the so-called City in the Sky or Rapture in the Sky, which would eventually become the floating city of Columbia, and would be set in the year 1912. A lot of different art styles and directions were played with in creating Columbia, which can be seen in various pieces of concept art. It was originally also shown to be a lot darker visually, with more stormy weather being present although this was scrapped in order to contrast with the bleaker aesthetics of Rapture. Even the logo went through many changes over the years, which can be seen in these designs here. As for the supernatural aspects of the game, that was actually planned to play a much bigger role in the story, including Elizabeth's powers and tears in general, which would have created new types of enemies called the Merged, which are pretty creepy. Don't worry, we'll get to them in their own section but the citizens of Columbia were also meant to play a much bigger role in the gameplay and story, as most of them could be attacked and would then proceed to engage in fights with the player, at least in certain instances as seen in some of the gameplay trailers. There was also a much more in-depth faction system planned, as the conflict between the Vox Populi and the Founders was going to be a much larger part of the game, which can be seen in early trailers and demos. In a 2011 E3 demo, we can see that the conflict between the Vox and the Founders is basically a full-on revolution, and is already in full swing by the time Booker arrives in Columbia. Not only that, but there were also many more choices planned in regards to this conflict, and the game as a whole. Which can be seen in the trailer, where Booker is given the choice of stopping an execution of a postman by the Vox Populi. And we can see that by choosing to save him, he actually angers the Vox and has to fight a large group of them. And it's thought that there would be many more small choices like this throughout the game. At least before this revolution seemingly took a kind of back seat in the final release. Other gameplay differences include a different 1999 mode in which the player would have to select a certain class at the beginning of the game which could not be changed, 
The classes were called Melee, Mobility, Soldier, Tank, and Vigor, and it's thought that these classes would limit the weapons, gear, and vigors that the player could use. But also, there was apparently at some stage an experience system, as in the game's files, it was found that there was text for the UI which read, Congratulations, you've leveled up. But in the game we have now, 1999 mode is basically just a harder hard mode, with reduced ammo, increased enemy damage, reduced player health, that sort of thing. Also, there was actually multiplayer planned at some stage for Bioshock Infinite. Not like the Bioshock 2 multiplayer, more of like a PvE-style co-op. And we know about two of the modes that would have been featured in this. The first is called Border Patrol, which is pretty wild. So basically, two players would have to defend an area against racist caricature enemies. As this game mode, Border Patrol, was meant to be a sort of propaganda game played by children in Colombia. Next there was the Spec Ops mode, which would have involved four players working together against enemy AI, with each player being able to choose a class. Maybe the same ones as the original 1999 mode had, but we're not too sure on that. And it's thought that these Spec Ops levels would simply be reused areas from the story mode for the most part, but there was one level at least that was created for the mode, simply referred to as the Museum, which was actually almost finished before the mode and the multiplayer as a whole was eventually scrapped. There are also quite a few HUDs and interfaces which were early designs or were just never used in the game, such as with this gear store. The skylines and skyhooks also changed over time, as seen in the demos. However, the skyhook was made to be more mechanical so that it could be used as a brutal melee weapon, complete with very violent executions. There were also jump shoes that allowed the player to jump to greater heights, as well as a jetpack, which both have concept art of their designs. Although, of course, these were scrapped in favor of the skyline system. For a while, too, it was also possible for Booker to hack the vending machines in Columbia using some sort of device, although this was most likely cut in favor of the possession vigor. The tears were also planned to be a lot more significant, not just in gameplay, but they would also affect Elizabeth, as they were shown to cause damage to her every time you used one. And this was planned to actually affect your ending, based on how many times you summoned tears. There was also planned to be quite a few destructible objects and environments in Colombia, but those were also cut. As for weapons, there is some concept art of the early versions of some weapons, as well as concept art of weapons that never actually made it into the game, like the Skyline Machine Gun and the Mortar. In terms of vigors, some of the ones we see in the game were slightly different, such as Devil's Kiss having a charged attack instead of a trap or Shock Jockey, which looked very similar to Electro Bolt from Bioshock, and didn't have the whole crystal thing we see in the game today. Possession was also different, and was at one point called Mesmerize, and would rather stun enemies instead of making them help the player. And instead of the ghostly green effect, Booker's hand would be covered in vines and purple flowers. Also, Undertow used to turn Booker's fingers into tentacles, which is pretty cool. There were also some completely cut vigors, such as a telekinesis-like one, as well as another one called Weapon Slave, which would allow the player to take control of unused weapons and turn them against enemies. Also in the files, there was found something very similar to the Vita Chambers from Bioshock, a tomb called Resurrecto, which is where Booker would respawn from before it was eventually cut. Also, there was only one cut Voxophone, which are the audio logs of this game. And it doesn't even have audio, it's just a transcript. And there are a couple of cut kinetoscopes, nothing too interesting here though. A few random props, paintings, posters, and objects that went unused, such as this artillery gun. Some of the levels also had some differences, and there were even some parts of the game that went unused. In Soldier's Field, there was a fully modeled ferris wheel that was moved. It's still in the game, but very far away from the player and in a different spot. There are also some unused statues and cut animatronics that would have been featured presumably in the Hall of Heroes. And in Emporia, there was going to be a dental office, which would have a scripted event in which the dentist is actually thrown out of a window by one of the Vox. There was also some concept art of Finkton and Shantytown that looks different from the actual game. 
And I won't go into spoilers, but at the very end of the game, there is a reference to System Shock 2 that was planned that was actually cut, as they found a fully modeled Citadel station in the files. And there was also a completely cut level called the Mad Toymaker's Shop, which would have been a location in which Booker would have to fight and defeat the so-called Toymaker, who was the one creating these automatons in Colombia. Moving on to the best part in my opinion, we have the characters and enemies. Starting off with the main man himself, Booker was voiced by Steven Russell in the first demo trailer, and he sounds noticeably older. And also, one of his arms with a V tattoo was also found in the files. Presumably, it's related to the Vox. Also, Elizabeth went through many changes throughout development, including one of her early models nicknamed Gibson Girl, as well as the Alpha slash Beta version. Slate was also planned to be a so-called Vigor Junkie, basically Columbia's counterpart to a splicer before they were also cut. There's also alternative designs for the character Daisy Fitzroy. Comstock also went through a lot of different iterations, some of which could be seen in the trailers. Now the cut NPCs are where it really gets interesting. First, the vending machines in the game were actually going to be animatronics that walked around, called Automatic Gentlemen, as seen in the concept art. And Boys of Silence were also meant to be much more prevalent, instead of only appearing in Comstock House. They were actually meant to be in the entire game, acting as a kind of alarm system to alert nearby enemies. Then there is the concept of the Claw Daddy enemy. Pretty interesting, but I guess this concept was eventually turned into the Handyman. Like I mentioned earlier, there was also the concept of Vigor Junkies, as well as another type of enemy, the Merged, which were disturbing, contorted versions of Colombian citizens. Ones that had been exposed to tears that changed them, making them and the Vigor Junkies into more splicer-like enemies. And there are quite a few pieces of concept art on what these would have looked like, and yeah, they're pretty creepy. There were also some very stylized and almost cartoonish looking citizens which were found in the concept art. And there was also the character of Henry Saltonstall, a Colombian politician featured prominently in one of the gameplay demos, along with his assistant Charles, who would actually attack the player after he picked up one of the rifles during his speech. We can also see that Saltonstall is affected by the tears and could be one of the merged. And also interestingly, his American flag pin changes to the hammer and sickle. So yeah, this is definitely something to do with the tears. And after killing Charles, this would be how Booker acquired Murder of Crows, which would then trigger a fight in which Saltonstall would flee using the skyline, and get to a huge cannon to fire at Booker. It's all featured in the demo, but never made it into the game unfortunately. There's also this kind of creepy mechanical doll looking enemy seen in an early prototype. And there's also another cut enemy called Electro Gloves, as seen in concept art. And it looks like he would most likely shoot electricity at the player through whatever this thing is, which is kind of weird because the Shock Jockey Vigor does the exact same thing, but maybe this would have just powered it up more, I don't really know. There was also another enemy called Snake Oil, or the Enhancer, who would carry what looks like vigors or potions or something and would heal nearby enemies as well as attack the player. There were also going to be unique Fink security enemies donning their own green outfits, as well as some Fink factory workers, which are shown in some of the concept art. There were also another set of planned enemies called the Freaks, which were these kind of mutated enemies that were like zombies or something, as they would go around eating corpses. Not sure how this was meant to fit into the game, but yeah, pretty weird. Then there were also the toys of the Mad Toymaker, and these would be the enemies of that cut level we discussed. And there were also these magician enemies planned. Basically just people who could use telekinesis, at least that's what we see here in this concept art. There were also various versions of the motorized patriots, starting out from the automated gentleman and evolving to what we have today. But there were also Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin designs. There was also a little sister-like counterpart that was designed, but also never really went anywhere. Also an early version of the Siren was known as the Resurrector, and looked to resemble a Catholic priest who could revive enemies similar to the Siren. 
A piece of concept art also revealed a security camera automaton, which may have been an early version of the Boys of Silence, and if you've seen my Lost and Cut content of Manhunt video, this kind of reminds me of the cut cam heads from that game. And then lastly for the cut enemies, there was also a Columbia tank, which was shown only in the concept art. And yeah, that about does it for the cut and lost content of the Bioshock franchise. And of course I didn't get to cover absolutely everything, but I think I got the most interesting parts. Let me know if there's anything really cool that I missed though. But yeah, I still love this franchise and these games, especially the first one. And I really hope that Bioshock 4, the one that's in development right now, holds up to this standard of quality that we've come to expect. But let me know, did any of these pieces of cut content catch you off guard, or change your perspective on anything in the series? Let me know. Also, if you think there are other games like this, with interesting pieces of lost and cut content that I should cover, let me know about that as well. I had a lot of fun making this video, and I hope to continue this series with more games and franchises. Anyway, this has been me, Sourcebrew. Hope you all enjoyed the video. Like and subscribe for more content like this, and I will see you with the next one. Peace.